morning, everyone, and we are live from Boom Church of God of Prophecy. We want to welcome you out to the service on this glorious Palm Sunday. We believe that the Word of God will be a blessing to you today as you worship the Lord with us right there where you're at. We believe that Jesus will be honored and glorified. I want to let you know before we pray that uh, today also is not only Palm Sunday, but our Communion Sunday. So we're going to be partaking of the elements of communion together at the end of our service. So we ask if you can, you know, put together some crackers. If you have some grape juice, great. You know, use what you can because it's a matter of the heart. And uh, we want to worship together and obey what Jesus told us to do. He said, do this in remembrance of me. This being the first Sunday of April, um, we're going to be worshiping the Lord with communion as well. Father, we just want to thank you that you are alive and well today. Praise God, you're on your throne and uh, you, your spirit is moving even now as we are here together in this place. Um, your word says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And so we believe that you are here, you are in our midst, you are right with the people as they're, as they're watching this service live. Um, your anointing reaches out and touches them right now where they are. Your spirit ministers to them right where they are. Your word goes forth and touches life. And your word your word does not return void. It, accompli it accomplishes what it is sent to do, and it prospers in the area to which it is sent. And so we believe that as we go forth today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to worship the Lord for a little bit today. He's worthy to be praised. Sing, oh, sad. 
God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock. Oh, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Oh, magnify. Praise Him right Praise. where you are right now. There's no distance Thank in the Spirit. There's Praise. no distance in faith. Worship yes. Him right where you are right now. Praise. And praise, praise Him, for He is worthy to be praised. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. Be exalted. Yes. Exalt Him. <laughs> Amen. Praise Him. You know... Next Lord's Day, next Sunday, is Resurrection Sunday. But, you know, we'll celebrate that next week together right here via Facebook Live. But, uh, you know, we have a living Savior today. We know he's already risen. Yes. And we celebrate and live in that resurrection power every day. There's a lot of bad news out there right now. But here's the good news. It was written by Bill and Gloria Gaither many years ago. And here it is. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow.
Sister Ann Crutchfield being on the piano, Brother Allen here with us, and of course, Joy Sand and I obviously are here. Uh, no secret there. Praise God. Uh, let me just step off a minute to change uh, the set just a bit. Everything is live, so uh, praise God. But, uh, and we are glad that you're there via live stream with us right here on uh, Facebook Live. You know, it's not, hold on just a second. Granted, not a, an ideal situation how we're having to do things right now. But you know what? The Bible says that the Word of God is not bound. And uh, the Word of God is still going forth, not only with us here, but uh, with churches all over the country and all over the world today are meeting just like we are. Many are meeting on Facebook Live like we are here. Uh, some are up some other platforms, but uh, the point is the Word of God is still going forth, and the Word still works. I want to encourage you that uh, God is still on His throne. We're going to talk about that a bit today, but... Uh, 
Jesus, like we sang it today, he's alive, amen? And uh, so I just encourage you right where you're at just to give him praise because he's worthy to receive it, amen? And uh, let's hold up our Bibles, and uh, like we like to do, let's hold up our Bibles, whatever form they're in, let's hold them up here. And let's say this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. The Word is a lamp unto my feet. The Word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light unto my path. And a light unto my path. I receive the light. I receive the light. I believe the Word of God. I believe the Word of God. Because it is impossible. Because it is impossible. For God to lie. For God to lie. Hallelujah. That Amen. is right. Amen. You know, I want to bring a message today. We're going to be pausing our current series on the Believer's Authority for two weeks for, you know, today to recognize and celebrate Palm Sunday, next Sunday, Lord willing, to, to celebrate the glorious resurrection. We plan on returning to the Believer's Authority in two weeks' time. But uh, this is an extremely important time of year, and I want to bring a message this morning, why Palm Sunday is still in the palm of God. Why Palm Sunday is still in the palm of God. You know, COVID-19, this uh, strain of the coronavirus has hit us hard. Some are fearing for their lives, others uh, the lives of loved ones. Others may be fearing the lives, uh, the loss rather, of your livelihood, as non-essential businesses have been forced to close indefinitely, leading to profit losses and mass layoffs. In addition to all these worries, those these potential things to worry about, as we head into the week of Easter, we do so obviously unable to meet together with our local church families. Today is Palm Sunday, and it's usually a day of hope and celebration. But this year's celebration looks quite different, doesn't it? And that may be leaving you with the feeling that life is spinning out of control. Let me tell you, that's a completely understandable feeling. I want to tell you that faith does not deny feelings. Faith does not deny feelings. Feelings are very real. In fact, God gave us our feelings. In fact, we are a three-part being. Many of you have heard me teach on this, but we are a spirit. We have a soul, and that soul is comprised of our mind, will, and our emotions. And we, that, that, that spirit and that soul is housed in this physical body with which we contact the three-dimensional physical world, but those feelings and those emotions are real. I am not telling you they're not real. Not only that, I'm not minimizing your feelings. I'm not telling you to deny your feelings. What I am telling you is to not, is to not allow yourself to be moved off of the Word of God because of your feelings. Amen. Now, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Here's what I want you to know, however, even though you may have those feelings and those feelings are very real. God is still God. He's still on his throne. Jesus is still Lord. The Holy Ghost is still active and moving through the earth. And the word of God still works. Praise the Lord. Now, turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them there today, to Psalm 46. Here's where we're going to start in today. Psalm 46. And uh, we're going to look at the first three verses. Psalm 46. Verses 1 through 3. Give you just a minute or so to get there to Psalm 46, 1 through 3. But as you're doing that, I want you to see that the theme here in this text is a, calm, is a common one to the Psalms. Namely, that God is a refuge, a place of safety for his people. I want to read that text, Psalm 46, 1 through 3. This happens to be the King James Version. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled. 
Though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. That means pause and consider. Now, notice two words here by way of introduction that we need to lay hold of today, folks. Number one, God is our refuge. God is our refuge, and this means an abundantly available help. I don't know about you, but that's good news to me, that God is an abundantly available help to his people. In fact, the CSB translates this, a helper who is always found in time of trouble. <laughs> I like that. Refuge is the Hebrew word there, mahuse. Mahuse, and it is a shelter, a refuge, protection, fortress, a hope, a place of trust, a shelter from the storm. I mean, if you know it's great when there's a storm raging to have a shelter. Uh -huh. God is our refuge. He's our shelter. He's our place to run to in the midst of the storm. Hallelujah. Not only that, but God is our strength, secondly. This is the little Hebrew word oz, the Hebrew word oz, and it is strength, power, and security. It's from a root that means to be firm and strong. So you have one who is firm and strong, who is your shelter, your refuge, your place to hide and be safe in the time of the storm and in the time of trouble. It's supposed that this particular psalm was written during the siege of Jerusalem by Sennacherib. It pictures a successful defense, not a victorious campaign. The psalmist here, if you notice in verse 2, uses hyperbole, that is purposeful exaggeration, to illustrate the worst possible things that can happen. What's the worst possible things that could happen? Well, the earth be removed. The waters thereof roar and be troubled. Uh, the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. That is absolutely the worst case scenario that could ever happen. And yet in the face of all of that, the Bible says, God's people, we will not fear. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He uses purposeful exaggeration to illustrate the worst possible things that could happen. And in the midst of it all, he says, we will not fear. Praise the Lord. Even in the midst of pandemic, I want you to know that Palm Sunday is still in the palm of God. And even though our church's plans have been altered this year, God's plans are never thwarted. And I want you to get a hold of that. Even though our church's plans have been altered this year, God's plans are never thwarted. Turn with me because this is the passage that... Uh, now, now, we'll talk about this in a minute, but uh, I want to go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, and verse 1. Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, and verse 1. This section of scripture is usually in this account that Mark covers, Matthew covers it, Luke covers it, John covers it. It's traditionally referred to as the triumphal entry. It's more accurately, though, Jesus' coronation as the true king. The significance of this event can be seen in the fact that it's only the second time in all of Scripture that all four gospel writers record the same event. Here are three truths to look at that will help you to look, I should say, to Palm Sunday with hope and faith, even in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. Number one, COVID-19 isn't a surprise to God. COVID-19 isn't a surprise to God. Look at verse 1 of Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. The Bible says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. 
And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him thither, or hither, pardon me. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto him, Why do you, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him. And he, Jesus that is, sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches off the trees and strewed them in the way. Um, and, well, let's just stop there at verse 8. And strawed them, not strewed them, and strawed them in the way. Praise the Lord. Now, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, it's easy to see that God was in control. Number one, Jesus told his disciples where this house was, where the colt was, what to say to the man who owned the colt. He knew this, folks, by the supernatural gift of the word of knowledge being one of the nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit listed for us in 1 Corinthians 12. Jesus knew by the word of knowledge where this man was, where this animal was, what, the, what to say to the man, what the man's response would be. He knew all of that supernaturally. There's no indication that he'd had any collusion with this man ahead of time. He hadn't been to Jerusalem in quite a while, and yet he knew by the word of knowledge what was going to happen, what to do. Number two, there is no indication that any previous arrangements had been made with the owners of the or the owner of these animals. Jesus hadn't been, like I said a moment ago, to Jerusalem in quite a while, and yet this man that owned the colt released the animals. This is supernatural. God was in control here. Very clear in all this. Number three, the Bible says that that it, it there in. Um, there in verse, what is it, verse 2, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, you shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. <laughs> That's an important detail, folks. Why? Because it tells us this colt had never been ridden. I don't know if you've ever been around horses or not. I don't know if you've ever been around mules or not, or any other animal that you ride there is a process that has gone through where that animal is broken, as the terminology is used, so that it will not buck and, and revolt uh, over someone riding it. The first, I mean, you get, a, you get a horse that's never been broken and you try to jump on his back, you're going to have some problems. Until that horse is broken, that is trained to take a rider on their back and let him ride. But the Bible says this colt, no man had ever sat on it. Now what does that show us? Jesus rode the animal even though no man had ridden it before. It had never been broken as we use that terminology. That demonstrated, folks, that Jesus was and is Lord over all creation. He is Lord over his creation. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 in the New Living Translation tells us this. For through him, that is through Jesus, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him being Jesus and for him. He existed before anything else, and he, Jesus, holds all creation together. Awesome. Yes. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, again, the New Living Translation. Watch this. The people obviously recognized this authority by how they responded. 
The Bible says they began to lay their garments on the back of this animal so Jesus could get on. It would be a natural blanket or covering, if you will, so he could sit on this animal. And not only that, the Bible says they began to spread the rest of their garments in the way before him. This was a, a way um, that... that that, that, that people recognized a typical response, if you will, when a king rode into your town. That's how you did it. You had a parade. You had a celebration. You, you recognized that king's authority. And this is what they did with Jesus. Perhaps some of the people recognized Jesus coming in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, 9, where said, your king cometh unto you lowly in sitting upon a donkey, a colt. But regardless, this event, this shows him that they recognized him as Savior and Messiah and King. God was in control. Now, fast forward to the next Friday. The king is hanging on a tree. The king is hanging on a cross. The king had been severely beaten he had endured a mock trial and tremendous humiliation he'd been spat upon he'd been beaten he'd been scourged by a cruel roman scourge and here he is now in extreme pain that you can't even imagine all that he endured and he's hanging on a cross Friday, from Sunday to Friday what a difference a week makes and here is the king now hanging on a cross, completely humiliated before all the watching eyes, hanging, the Bible says, between two thieves. <laughs> it's a little harder to see God in control there, isn't it? But here's the thing. None of this was a surprise to Jesus. It wasn't a surprise to Jesus that the people sang as he came in to Jerusalem writing. And even as he entered in Jerusalem, now think of this. He was fully aware that he was entering into Jerusalem to begin the very last week of his earthly ministry and of his earthly life. He knew all of that. He knew full well that this week would end in crucifixion. Jesus knew that while this crowd of people sang his praises, a different crowd, and even some of these same people probably, would surround him later that week to call for his death. He knew all of it. But even more than that, Jesus knew that God the Father had a plan. See, God isn't surprised, beloved, that COVID-19 has become a global pandemic, and he isn't surprised either that it is happening during Holy Week, and what is more, he still has a plan. He has a plan for this world. He has a plan for his body, the church. He has a plan for the Jews. He has a plan for the goyim, the nations, the three groups of people that 1 Corinthians 10.32 tell us that he sees in the earth. He has a plan. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. And really, that plan can be summed up in the words of Jeremiah 29.11. I know the plans I have for you. Plans for good, not evil, <laughs> to give you a future and a hope. Can I tell you that God's plan, like we said earlier, aren't thwarted. God still has a plan to bless you as his child. If you are his child watching me right now, uh, if, if you're a believer, uh, if, if you're not a believer, God has a plan for you, and that is that you get born again and that you come into the family of God so that you can get in on the covenant blessings. That's God's plan for you. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's got a plan. Amen. He's got a plan. Understand, boy, you need to get a hold of this because I've been hearing preachers, you know, you hear preachers say this and you hear preachers say that and you hear all these things that are going around uh, right now about this thing. Understand this right now. God 
doesn't send evils like COVID-19. The Bible says, John 10.10, 10, the dividing line of the word of God, the thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That's what God does. But, but, but watch this. Even though God doesn't send evils like this, Romans 8.28 is still true. Romans 8.28 in the Amplified Classic Version, <clears throat> pardon me, says this. We are assured and know that God, being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. Romans 8. 28 is still true and trust that God has a plan even as you celebrate Palm Sunday from home this year. Secondly, our need for salvation hasn't changed. You just feel it more and that's a good thing. Our need for salvation hasn't changed. You just feel it more and that's a good thing. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the people began using a word that may be unfamiliar to many. They began to say, Hosanna. Now, if they were speaking Hebrew, what they would have said there is, Hoshia, Hosanna, Hoshia, Hosanna. That means Savior, save us now. This is a Hebrew word, a prayer originally that means Savior, save us now. See, the people of Israel have been living under the oppression of foreign governments for the better part of five centuries by this time. They'd spent 430 years in cruel, uh, well, that entire 430 years wasn't a cruel time, but the last hundred or so years of it, it was cruel bondage and slavery in Egypt. They then were in captivity for 70 years to Babylon. They were under the hand and authority of Medo-Persia. They were under the authority of Greece. And now they were under the authority of the cruel regime and government of Rome. They were looking for a savior who would save them from this oppression. Get us out from underneath the, the cruel hand of this governmental oppression. Save us. See, in a similar fashion, many are crying out to God concerning this pandemic. They just want it to end. Save us, Lord. Get this sickness out of here. Get this pandemic out of here. Cause this virus to end. I don't want to be sick. I don't want to have my job in jeopardy. I don't want to have my, my livelihood gone. I don't want to lose everything I have. Just save me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And they're reaching out to God. Some people who never have reached out to God have, are doing it now. Uh, there was a survey this week that 21.9% of people who, have, who said they've never Ever, ever read the word of God before in the midst of this are starting to read their Bibles. Oh, that's great. Let me tell you something. There are people who have never prayed before that are praying right now. There are Christians who had a nominal prayer life that are starting to pray right now. And that's great. But you see, these people were saying, Hosanna, save us now. But what they didn't realize is that Jesus came to set free, set them free, set us free from something far greater than the Roman Empire. He came to set them free from their bondage to sin and death. And this is the same salvation that Jesus offers us today. Can I tell you very candidly? I got to tell you. Through all of this, there's a lot of us that are getting a whole lot bolder right now. You know, before this happened, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, I got to kind of watch what I say because, you know, somebody's going to get offended. Somebody's going to get hurt. You know, they're going to get mad. They're going to, you know, they're going to get their feelings hurt. Let me tell you something. I'd, re I'd rather offend you into heaven than to lull you into hell. Do you hear me? 
Amen. I'd rather offend you into recognizing that you are a sinner in need of a Savior than just comfort you to hell. Okay? I'm just going to say it straight. And uh, we don't have time to be worrying about, gee, are we going to upset someone? Are we going to upset their gentle sensitivities? Let me, say it, let me tell you something. You need... Let me do something real quick. Forgot to turn that on. Praise the Lord. All right. Let me do something real quick. This is all live. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's keep going here. Realized I hadn't turned my uh, power on and my battery was telling me it was low. Now we'll be okay. Praise the Lord. But here it is. Here it is. I don't mind telling you this, without Jesus, all is lost. Without Jesus, you are lost. Without Jesus, you have no hope in this world. Hear me. The government is not your hope. Thank God for these stimulus checks or whatever they're calling them going out to people. That's great. Whenever we get them, that's great. That's going to help people, and I'm, I'm all for that. You know, and I, I'm, I'm all for all the programs that are helping people. I'm all for that. But I want to tell you something. When it right now, when it right comes down to the rubber meeting the proverbial road, all is lost without Jesus. You are lost without Jesus. Amen. You can get a check in your bank account. And thank God for that. But if your soul is bankrupt, you're still heading for hell. Amen. Amen. Whew. Wow. All is lost without Jesus. We don't always feel the reality of that, though. Living in the modern world with relative wealth and comfort, we often fall asleep <laughs> to our need to be saved. But as we live through this current threat to our health and well-being, all that's changed. We're reminded of just how delicate life is. We're reminded of just how temporary life is. We're reminded of how quickly life can end. We're reminded of how quickly everything that we thought was secure could be shaken to the core. Hmm. That's right. this, a time like this reminds us of how much we need Jesus, both in this life and in the next so as you celebrate Palm Sunday, do so with the same kind of desperate yet joyful dependence that the crowd placed on Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. And last, certainly not least, thirdly, Palm Sunday is a day of expectation. Palm Sunday is a day of expectation. Palm Sunday is a great day. In fact, of expectation. It's the beginning of Holy Week, where we remember the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, climaxing, of course, with his glorious resurrection on Resurrection Sunday morning. Holy Week tells the story of why the church exists, where we find hope, and what the future holds. It's a week of eager expectation about the great things we know God will do among us in the very same way it was for the crowds on that first Palm Sunday. Can I tell you, God is still in the business of doing great and glorious things even today. He wants to do that for you. He wants to do that for me. Oh, watch this. So instead of allowing yourself to be filled with a sense of discouragement, dread, or disappointment this week, ask Jesus to once again fill your heart with a sense of hope. God has done great things. He is doing great things, even if you currently can't see them. And God will do great things. Believe it. It's what this Palm Sunday is all about. This is Holy Week. This is a Holy Week to remember. Regardless of what happens this Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter, 
This year's Holy Week will certainly be memorable. Choose to look for all the unique ways that God is working in your life, in your family, and in your community during this time. He's working. Are you watching? The God who saves, let me tell you, has not left us. He is actively working. He has a plan. Miracles we can't yet imagine are just around the corner. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word today. We want to thank you that your word is alive and full of power. We thank you that your word works. We thank you that it is effectively working in those who have heard it today and will continue to work in those who go out to the archive and watch this a little bit later, who those who go out to YouTube and view this. Your word is effectively working in all who have heard it. And we ask you to take this word into the hearts of people, cause understanding to come to them, in the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen and amen. Now, today, as I said earlier, we are going to together, now even though we're not together here um, at the church, that is, we are um, gathered together via live stream, but we are still going to be uh, we're going to be partaking of the elements of communion. So I hope that you have gathered your elements together, whatever you can put together, a piece of bread, hopefully some grape juice if you can. But I just wanted to read something from the Word of God before we partake of the elements of communion. You know, the Apostle Paul was given a revelation from Jesus himself. He did not learn about the Lord's Supper from the other disciples. He didn't learn it from Barnabas. He didn't learn it from anyone else. He got that directly from the Lord. He tells you this in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 23. He says, For I have received of the Lord, which also I delivered unto you. He received this from the Lord. Then he delivered this to the Corinthians, and consequently it's delivered to us, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. The bread represents, the broken bread represents the broken body of Jesus. Now his bones were not broken. He was the perfect fulfillment of the Paschal or the Passover lamb. His bones were not broken. Not a bone was to be broken in the Passover lamb. Not a bone of Jesus was broken, but his body was broken. He had a cruel crown of thorns driven into his brow. He was beaten, bloody, and his back was in ribbons from the cruel scourging that he received at the hands of Roman guards. His body was broken, not bones, but his body. The weight of his body hanging from spikes driven into his wrist. The weight of his body hanging on those would have thrown his shoulders out of joint. His body was broken. And this bread, broken bread, represents his broken body. Now, I don't want you to miss the significance of it. You know, sometimes, this is why normally on a communion Sunday, I teach from the Word of God concerning the some significant point about communion. But let me just tell you this today. That broken body, that bread, symbolizes the beating that Jesus took and his broken body was done so that yours could be whole, okay? The Bible says he was wounded in Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace, or more accurately, probably the chastisement that brought us peace was laid upon him and with his stripes, we are healed. 
1 Peter 2.24 says, Who in his own body bear our sins on the tree, that we, being dead unto sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. So, when you take the element of the bread in communion, you should do so in faith, expecting that the price Jesus paid for your healing, you appropriate that by faith, you take that into you, and you believe that as that bread is assimilated into your body, that it touches every joint, every muscle, every tissue, every cell of your body, and the healing virtue of Jesus touches you, and you receive it. Now he goes on, and when uh, he goes on to say, rather, in verse 25, after the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament, literally new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. We're making a proclamation every time we take of these elements. We are saying, we believe, Lord Jesus, that you are coming again, and every time we take this, we proclaim that, the Bible says. But the blood, the blood cleanses from sin. You know, the Bible says we were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our vain conversation or manner of life, but by the precious blood of Christ, he redeemed you, that is, purchased you out of the, the captivity of sin by his precious blood. But not only is there a cleansing in the blood, there is a protective covering in the blood. And so every time that you partake of this element of the shed blood of Jesus, you should do so receiving a fresh cleansing from sin, from unrighteousness, from anything that may be out of line with the word of God in your life. You can receive the cleansing of that, but also you receive the covering of that blood. Listen. At that very first Passover, the Bible says, Jesus is our Passover. Paul wrote it. He said, Jesus is our Passover. And at that very first Passover, there was a hyssop branch. And that little lamb was slain. And the blood from that little lamb was put in a basin. And a hyssop branch was taken. And they struck it on the lintel and the doorposts of their house. Really in the shape of a cross, if you get right down to it. And the Bible says, when that death angel as it's referred to pass through the land that night and every firstborn son in every house died uh, the Bible says when I see the blood I will pass over you now listen we're heading into Passover season on the Hebrew calendar it's a it's a date that separate celebrates that first Passover but I want to tell you, if you will put, apply by faith the blood of Jesus to your life, to your home, you can expect that same delivering power of the blood. And when things are passing through the land, when the Lord sees the blood, figuratively speaking, by faith, applied to your home and to your life, those things will pass over you, if you believe it. Amen. So, as you partake of the element of the cup, Receive cleansing from that blood and receive the protective covering of that blood. I'm going to ask uh, Joyce Ann to join me up here and we're going to partake together. Uh, you guys already have your, your crackers and everything? Over, you have yours, Alan, brother? Yeah. Okay, great. Now, the Bible, and we're going to have our sister play a little music here, I think, while we uh, partake of this. And she's going to partake with us, obviously. Yes. The Bible says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, we, we read it a minute ago, he took bread. And when he had broken, now here I have in my hand a piece of cracker. It symbolizes that broken bread. I hope that you have your element right there. If you do, take it in your hand right now. Let's hold it up and say, Father, we believe this is blessed in the name of Jesus. We believe this element of your blood, of your, of your broken body, and it's symbolized in this cracker, this bread. 
we receive that and we receive the healing that it provides yes. praise god yes. we believe that as we eat this bread this cracker that it goes to every cell it goes to every joint, it goes to every tissue, it goes to every blood vessel, it goes to every cell of our body, working healing and health yes. in us. And we receive this element of the bread together by faith. Receive the element of the bread. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. Thank you, Lord. Now, the Bible says, after the same manner, he took the cup. After he'd supped, after he'd eaten, and he says, this is the new, and I know our King James Version says testament, but it's literally... This is the new covenant of my blood. This is covenant. Yes. You know what you do in covenant? In covenant, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, God is saying something to you. He is saying in covenant, everything I have is yours. Everything you have is is mine. We are in covenant. If you have enemies, they're God's enemies. If you have difficulties, they're God's difficulties. If you have debts, they're God's debts. That's what covenant means. And every time you partake of this, you are saying to the Lord, everything, Lord, I have is yours. And everything you have is mine. And so together, let's take of the element of the precious blood of Jesus. Now, before we close this service today and I give you the, the, the benediction as it were, you can go ahead and keep playing if you want to, sister. Um, before I close that uh, service today, I may be talking to someone out there that doesn't know Jesus. You know, there's a lot of people right now that are looking to church services. They're tuning in. They're following these posts on Facebook and Twitter and, and uh, you know, all these different platforms. You're going out to perhaps the YouTube channel and watching later. But if you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord. That is, if you were to die today, you cannot say with absolute certainty, yes, I know that I would go home to be with the Lord. See, because the Bible says to be absent from the body for the believer is to be present with the Lord. So I may be talking to someone today, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. I want to invite you to do that today. You say, well, how do I do it? Do I have to you know, join a church? Do I have to join a particular denomination? Do I have to, you know, whatever? No, no, here it is. Now, yeah, the local church is important. You need to be, once you're a believer, yeah, you need to be a part of a good Bible teaching, Bible preaching local church. But here's the deal. Initially, coming to God in salvation is a very simple thing. The Bible says, and we, in fact, we can do it by ABC, okay? A. You acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And what sin mean? It means you've missed the mark. It means you have fallen short of God's standard, which all of us have, the Bible says. Romans 6.23, or pardon me, 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So you acknowledge that you're a sinner. You acknowledge, hey, I'm apart from God. I don't know the Lord. You acknowledge that, A. B, you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's right, and he's alive today. You believe that. 
You say, well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, no, no, you believe that. The Holy Spirit, see, will come and make that real to you. And I'm asking him right now, right where you're watching, to make that real to you. I sense the anointing of the Holy Spirit right now, touching hearts and lives. You ask the Lord to make that real to you. Believe, that's B. The Bible says that as one believes in their heart, you believe. C, you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. See, the Bible says... Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt believe with thine heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Verse 10 of that same opening says that, that with the heart man believes unto righteousness, that is right standing with God, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You just say, you know, Jesus be Lord of my life, I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead, and I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus right now. And the Bible says if you do that, you're saved. That is, your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is, you are now a child of God. That is, now you are in relationship with the God of the universe. Praise God. And if you, if, if you are doing that today, I want to welcome you to the family. But I'd, what I'd encourage you to do, if you're watching right now live, out there at our church page, there's a, there's a, a link there that says send us email. Click on that and uh, send us an email and say, hey, you know what? I received Jesus today. I, I asked Jesus to be Lord of my life. I made sure that I was a child of God. I made sure of that today. Amen. And send us an email and let us know that. We want to rejoice with you. I'll get you some material to help you with your relationship with God. But I want to, if you... Uh, or asking Jesus into your heart today as we use that terminology. If you're asking to be the Lord of your life and believing today, I want to hear about it. We want to rejoice with you. The angels are. The angels are rejoicing. The Bible says that there is rejoicing in the presence of God over, watch this, one sinner that repents. Listen, if salvation is such a big deal to God that all of heaven pauses in its praise to Almighty God to rejoice because you came home, it's a big deal, huh? It's Amen. a big deal. Amen. So I want to I want to encourage you now. For all of our church family out there, I just say the Lord and all of you, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, the Bible says when we do that, we place his name upon you and he will bless you. So, as we do, if you're sitting in these pews, I say, you are blessed. You are blessed coming in. You're blessed wherever you are today. You're blessed going out. You're blessed in all that you set your hand to. You are blessed in the city and the field. You're blessed in all that your hand touches. And this week... You know, you probably aren't getting out much. A lot of people aren't. But wherever you go, Matthew 5, 16 is going to be true in your life. Uh, 5, 5, 5, 16 is going to be true in your life that, um, praise the Lord, Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Just want to remind you that we are but a phone call, a text, an email, an instant message, whatever the case, away. We, we're here for you. We love you. Uh, we love you here at the church, and uh, we just want you to know that. And so uh, the Lord bless you as we, uh, as we close today. Amen.